If you have a Bible with you, today we're going to be continuing on in our sermon series that we started a few weeks ago. Of, on the book of James, we've been going through verse by verse, and the sermon series is entitled James, Where, our faith, where the Rubber of, of the Road Meets Our Faith. James, where the rubber of our rubber of the road meets our faith. Today, we're picking up where we left off. So if you have a Bible, we're going to start at verse 16 of James chapter 1. This morning, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Do not be dece- deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And may the Lord bless us as we read his word together this morning. There was once two boys who were playing on a playground at recess. When their teacher found out, one of them was making faces to the other student. Smiling sweetly, she gently reproved the child by saying, Son, when I was a child, I was told that if I made ugly faces, my face would freeze, and I would stay like that. The boy looked up into her face, looked intently for a moment, and then replied, Well, teacher, you can't say you weren't warned. (laughs) When we think about the essential elements that make up the Christian life, when what actually it looks like to walk with Christ, more than likely insults, pride, and being downright rude would not be phrases or words that we would use to describe that picture, would it? And yet many of us, when it comes to arguments that we have with others, we normally aren't too quick to concede humble ourselves, and pass up opportunities maybe to stick it to that other person. It reminds me of the story of the husband and wife who had just had an argument. Husband and wife were driving several miles down a country road, not saying a word. An earlier discussion had led to an argument, and neither one wanted to concede his or her position. As they passed a barnyard of mules and pigs, the wife sarcastically asked, Relatives of yours? Yep, the husband replied, (laughs) in-laws. If you were asked to describe what it means to be a Christian, to follow Jesus, to somebody who had never heard of the gospel message before, someone had no conception of what it was like to be a follower of Jesus Christ, more than likely, a lot of the things that we say in anger or in retaliation wouldn't be included in that picture that we would paint. Even though our text for today here in James chapter 1 is often used as a passage about talking about anger, which it does say stuff about that, if we were to look at where this passage sits in the whole context of, the God, of this letter of James, we would see that James starts today in what we're going to look at as an introduction to something that he is going to be talking about all throughout the rest of his letter. And it's something that we're going to be hitting on over and over again in some fashion or another throughout the rest of this sermon series. It's James' attempt, as he introduces what he's going to introduce today, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to paint the picture of what it actually looks like for a follower of Jesus Christ to actually 
follow daily after Jesus Christ. And in that, he gets us to think, what is the distinctive about the Christian life? Is it just that we carry around certain theologies in our mind? Is it just that we read our Bibles every day with hope? Is it just that we go to church on Sundays? Or is there more? What is it about the Christian experience that makes it distinctive and different? How would you answer those questions if you were asked? Today, what I'd like for us to do is we're going to look at four different principles that James brings forth for us to ponder and pray over as we walk with Christ. But before we do that, let's ask the Lord's blessing upon our time together by going to him in prayer. Father, we come before you now. And I pray, Lord, that you, whatever we brought with us today that may be heavy on our hearts or minds or, or maybe we're thinking about something that's going to happen after the service today, Lord, I pray that we lay those aside and focus on what you want to teach us today through your word. Lord, may this time be sweet. May this time be a time that we grow in the wisdom and knowledge of your word. May this be a time that is honoring to you. Glorify your name as we dig into this text today. And I pray this now in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So four principles that we take away from these verses, and this outline is in your bulletin if you wanted to follow along with that. I did not include the little sub points because this is my way of encouraging you to write as we go along in this message. So the first principle that we take away from these verses is this. Our ears listen for what our heart craves. Our ears listen for what our heart craves. I want you to start off here, not with verse 16, but I want to start off with verse 19. Notice the first thing that James says here in this verse. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear. Do you know why it is that we struggle to be a good listener? It's because we're so full of passion for our own kingdom, our own thoughts, our own purposes, our own plans. And we're usually about our own agenda. And when something or someone interrupts that plan that we have, sometimes we can get angry. Sometimes we can not hear it. I can't tell you how many times Stacy has either told me something and later on it comes up, or she's talking to me, and in my defense, sometimes she does talk to me during a Packer game, which I can't hear anything that goes on when that happens. But there are more often than not times where she has told me something or is telling me something, and I'm in a not there. I'm not present. I'm thinking about something else, or I don't remember it. Now, I blame... I, you know, I'm getting older, and so I, I might blame that a little bit. I, I've got dementia in my family, so, I mean, there's a lot of different, I, I'm a guy, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different th reasons I can use of, of why I didn't hear that. But if we think about this, how do we normally function with a person that we may be debating with? Do we usually respectfully give them the time that they need to present their point? Or are we already spitting out our wisdom and interrupting their thoughts? Or before they convey what they want to convey? I think this is pretty evident when you watch a political debate, isn't it? One representative doesn't give the time for the other representative to to, to finish their sense. It happens all the time. It drives me nuts, actually. I can't, I can't stand to watch a whole lot of it. But you know and I know very well, if we were honest with ourselves, 
that most of the time when we are talking with someone else, we're already thinking while that other person's talking. We're already thinking of what we want to say, aren't we? Why do we do this? It's because you and I are still, as followers of Jesus Christ, still battling the flesh. And that fleshly nature of ours is all about the kingdom of me, myself, and I. As a follower of Christ, though, this is where the butting of heads happens between the flesh and the spirit. Because as a follower of Jesus Christ, we're called to another kingdom. We're citizens of another kingdom. And that is one distinctive and fundamental way where we need to ask for his help for us to be others-focused rather than self-focused. This is why we listen to that other person. Because our, our life does not belong to us. It belongs to Christ. And because our life belongs to him, we should want to develop meaningful relationships with others. We should want to hear their story. We should want to be a part of what's going on in their life, not because we just care about them, but because we know that it honors and pleases the Lord. This is why it says here in James, let every person be quick to hear. This is why he starts off that verse with that phrase. One day, an old man was casually walking along a country lane with his dog and his mule. Suddenly, a speeding pickup truck careened around the corner, knocking the man, his mule, and his dog into the ditch. The old man decided to sue the driver of the truck, seeing to recoup the cost of the damages. While the old man was on the stand in the, court, in the courtroom, the counsel for the defense cross-examined the man by asking a simple question. I want you to answer yes or no to the following question. Did you or did you not say at the time of the accident that you were perfectly fine? The old man said, well, me and my dog and my mule were walking along the road. And the counsel of the defense interrupted and said, stop, stop, stop. I asked you, tell me yes or no. Did you say that you were perfectly fine at the time of the accident? Well, the old man continued, me and my dog and my mule were walking along the road. The defense attorney appealed to the judge and said, your honor, the man is not answering the question. Would you please insist that he answer the question? The judge said, well, obviously he wants to tell us something, so let him speak. So the old man continued, well, me and my dog and my mule were walking along the road, and this truck came around the corner far too fast, knocked us into the ditch. The driver stopped, got out of his truck, saw my dog was badly injured, went back to his truck, got his rifle, and he shot it. Then he saw that my mule had broken his leg, so he shot it too. And then he turned to me and said, how are you feeling, sir? And I said, I'm perfectly fine. <laughs> Listening takes sacrifice. It takes humility, and it takes the rescue of our heart from ourselves. This is what Jesus did. James continues on. After he says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, he then moves to the next phrase, slow to speak. And as we read this, the inner lawyer inside of ourselves already has a, an objection to this. <laughs> but here's the principle that we can take away from this. We've been called to a representative way of living. We've been called to a representative way of living. In other words, we're an ambassador to the King of Kings. This is why it says what it does in verses 16 through 18 of our text, where it says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is where? From above 
coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We belong to Christ. We are his. So why are we to be slow to speak? Because we want to make sure that our words represent well the person whose life we represent. You follow me when I say that? That might be a little bit kind of, kind of a tongue twister. But we want to represent well the life whose life we represent. That means representing his will. That means representing his plan. That means representing his message, the gospel message, his purpose, his character, his grace, what his word says. To represent him through what his word says. That means we don't speak to try and win people to ourselves. I don't stand up here so that you'll walk away saying, boy, Pastor Tyler is such a wise person. I don't think anybody's ever said that. I'm speaking for the king. I'm conveying to you, as someone who's been called by God to this position, what the scriptures say. Now, I want you to let this sink in. If you're listening, say amen. amen. Who are we to be chosen as an ambassador of the Lord who rules over all? Who are we? Who are we that he's chosen to place us within the relationships that he has to have the opportunity to present Christ to others by the way that we live. Who are we? What an awesome calling that that is. Is it not? Notice the last phrase that James uses here in this verse. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, and then he uses the phrase, slow to anger. This is the third principle we take away from our text. Sinful anger exposes the fact that we still have a deep allegiance to our own kingdom. Sinful anger exposes the fact that we still have a deep allegiance to our own kingdom. I want you to think about your past week here. Did you get angry at all? Did you get angry more than a few times? If so, how much of that anger had anything to do with the kingdom of God? I don't want you to tell me. Just think about it. How much of the anger that you had this past week was what Scripture would call righteous anger? The fact of the matter is, I'm willing to bet that the majority of our anger wasn't an anger over a violation of God's word. But we typically get angry over someone violating the laws of our own kingdom. Our kingdom of one. Our kingdom of me, myself, and I. Think about this. Why do you and I get angry in traffic? It's because in our kingdom, we would drive on roads paid for by other people who choose not to use them, right? Chuck Swindoll, pastor, author, one of my favorite preachers, says, I remember reading about an eagle that swooped to the ground one day, catching a weasel in his powerful talons. But when it flew away, its wings inexplicably went limp, and it dropped to the ground like a lifeless doll. As it turned out, the weasel had bitten its attacker in mid-flight, killing the proud eagle as it flew. 
If you and I cling to an attitude of anger or jealousy, it will, like the weasel, sink its teeth into us when we least expect it. Here is what unrighteous anger, sinful anger does. It exposes the fact that although we claim to be followers of Jesus Christ and devote our lives to his kingdom, we still have a deep, a deep allegiance to our own. Now, I don't want you guys to confuse sinful anger with which, what I mentioned a little bit ago, this righteous anger, like Jesus tipping tables over in the temple kind of anger. That was not sinful anger. So when we look at injustice being done today, when we look at things take place today in our world that is against God's word, and we get angry over that, that's not sinful. Could it lead to sinful anger if we feed it? Possibly. But that's where we need to be careful. A lot of people will say Christians are not supposed to be angry. Because if you serve a God of love, then you should be all about love. But does not Scripture tell us that God gets angry over things? Yes, God is a God of love but he's also a God of wrath. You say, well, we're supposed to love the sinner but hate the sin. The Bible doesn't say that. Because what the Bible does say is that God sends the sinner to hell, not the sin. Yes, we are to love others. Yes, we are to share the gospel message. But we are also called as followers of Jesus Christ to get angry over or hate what God hates. There's a list of those things of what God said he hates in the book of Proverbs. We won't go through that list today. But throughout the scriptures we see God has an anger towards particular sins. So it's not wrong to get angry over when a child is molested. Or a variation of other things we could talk about that are against God's word. God's righteous anger is the hope of the universe. That sounds kind of an oxymoron way of saying things, isn't it? Because it's through that anger that we see our own sinful state. Our own need for rescue. We see that that anger is towards our sin. That sin that Adam and Eve first committed in the garden Years and years and years ago. And ever since then, each and every one of us is born into that sin. With a sinful nature. And God has an anger towards that nature. A wrathful anger. A damnation anger towards that sin. But at the same time, John 3.16, you all know it, right? Right? For God so loved the world that he sent his son. Why? To provide eternal life to all who would believe. He provided satisfaction in God's eyes for that sin through what Jesus did by taking our sins on himself on that cross to provide eternal life to all who would repent and believe. And that was not a sinful anger that God had. It was a righteous anger 
towards our sin. That sin that Christ took on himself to where God had to look away from his son as he hung on that cross. God's righteous anger, therefore, is the hope of the universe because it is just, because it is holy, because it is merciful, and because it is right. Is God a God of love? Absolutely. But he's also a God of justice, holiness, righteousness, and anger. As long as you and I live in a fallen world where horrible things do take place, where there is injustice, where there is violence, where there is deceit, where there is brokenness, and the list goes on and on, you and I should not be passive. We can be righteously angry. Righteously angry. Don't miss what I said. Not selfish, not sinful, not ungodly. But we need to be careful and we need to ask the Lord in the midst of that anger, is this sinful? Am I stepping out of bounds here, Lord? If I am, bring me back. Because God's righteous anger is an anger of mercy, is an anger of justice, it is an anger of compassion, is an anger of sympathy. We don't often combine those words, do we? We don't often combine anger and mercy, anger and justice, anger, anger and compassion, anger and sympathy. We usually combine this word with revenge. Revenge. But God's anger is anger that is holy and pure. And as his representative, is, when we have that kind of attitude, in the midst of the things that we see taking place around us, it's an ambassadorial anger. One last verse. Look at verse 21. Actually, I missed verse 20 there. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That's talking about the sinful anger. Therefore, verse 21 says, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. The last principle that we take away from our text is that the righteous life means we're serious about sin and our hearts are open to God's truth. The righteous life means we're serious about sin and our hearts are open to God's truth. And might I add to that, even when the truth goes against our own desires, Here's what James is saying in regards to what living our lives as believers is about. We're quick to hear because we live with an others-centered focus. We're slow to speak because we know we have an ambassadorial calling to speak for the Lord. And we're slow to anger because we want to examine it whether or not it's sinful, selfish, or righteous. But this last verse here in verse 21 calls for two final things. Two final things in our walk with Christ. First, it's being serious about sin. And second, having our hearts open to the truth of God's word. What is this righteous life that we're called to? It means that through prayer, the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I reject the plans, purposes, wants, needs, feelings of our own 
kingdom of one and we submit to the one who purchased our life with his shed blood. So it's a rejection of ourselves. This is why Jesus said in Mark 8.34, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That is one of the most difficult verses, I think, for the follower of Jesus Christ. Because this denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following him, that is a daily thing. That is a moment-by-moment -moment thing, even. It's an understanding that as a follower of Christ, we've been bought through that precious blood, and this world and this life is not all about us. It's not about our own happiness. It's not about how far we can get ahead. It's not about how well we can be liked. It's not about getting everything that we want. This life is not about you and I. It is about him. And with that mindset the focus goes to where it's supposed to go. The praise, the adoration, the glory goes to whom it's belonging to. Did you know that when you and I get to glory, people are not going to be surrounding us in heaven, praising us, thanking us for how godly we were? Scripture defines and describes what we're going to be doing in heaven. And I can guarantee you this. It's not about you and I. We will be worshiping the one who will still bear the scars and took the punishment that you and I deserved. We will be worshiping, worshiping the Lord Jesus forever and ever and ever. Why? Because as it says in Revelation, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and glory and wisdom and strength. Bodybuilder was once visiting an African tribe and the tribal chief was just amazed at his physique. So the tribal chief asked the muscle builder, what do you do with all those muscles? The bodybuilder said, well, it's probably easier to show you than to explain. So we went into all these different presentations of his physique to show off the different muscles, the biceps, the triceps, the back, and the obliques. He just stood there, changing poses. After the presentation, the tribal chief said, well, that's pretty impressive, but I have a second question for you. What else do you do with those muscles? Well, the bodybuilder said, that's pretty much it. I work out to pose. The African chief said, what a waste, what a waste. Many Christians work out only to pose. They don't work out to use the muscles they've developed. They carry their Bibles, stand during praise and worship, raise their hands in praise to the Lord, and absorb the word of God from the sermon, only to leave the church and never use what they've learned. My prayer for us, is that we would be quick to humble ourselves. To ask the Lord to help us in these areas that we need help as we battle the flesh every single moment of every single day. And that we would live our lives to the way that he's called us to live. Quick to hear. Slow to speak. Slow to anger. Putting away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receiving with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. Let's pray. Father, we admit that this is not something that we can do on our own. 
For it says in John 15 that apart from you, we can do nothing. And so, Lord, we ask now, as we walk this life with you, as we follow you day by day, as a follower of Jesus Christ, help us to represent you well. And it starts in the home. The way we treat those who live within the same walls that we do. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we've blown up because our time has been interrupted by an inconvenient question. Forgive us for the times where we've been slothful when you've called us to step out. Forgive us for the, the moments, the opportunities that we've passed up to share the gospel with someone else only because we don't want to be looked at differently or we're afraid. Father, help us to be quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to get angry in a sinful manner. Father, help us to walk faithfully with you. And may you get the glory and the honor and the praise for it. May you use us as your vessel to be an inspiration and a witness to Jesus Christ. I pray you'll give us an opportunity this week, each and every one that's sitting here or watching online, an opportunity this week, bringing a person into our lives that we know that you've placed into our lives to share Christ with. And help us to be bold and seize that opportunity and to leave the results with you. I pray this now, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.